Welcome to our webinar. There are, if you are viewing this in webinar format, there are two functions you want to be aware of, the chat function and the Q&A function. Um, if you have trouble seeing or hearing us, please let us know. Um, if you're watching this later on YouTube, thanks for checking it out. Okay, I just want to start off by uh, introducing myself. My name is Shannon Henson. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions for the University of Georgia School of Law. I am a 2003 graduate of the University of Georgia undergrad. I was a history major and art history minor. I graduated in 2006 from the University of Georgia, and then I went to practice law in Atlanta for uh, eight years before coming back to Athens last year. And I will let the ladies with me here introduce themselves as well, starting with Jenna. My name is Jenna Jackson. I just recently took um, the Assistant Director of Recruitment and Student Experience job here at UGA Law. I am a 2014 Georgia Law grad. I have a bachelor's from Mercer University, and um, I'm just really happy to be here. All right, go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Mary Grace Griffin. I'm a second-year law student from Bainbridge, Georgia. I am a 2014 graduate from the University of Georgia, uh, where I received my undergrad in public relations and political science. Okay, awesome. Thanks, ladies. Um, so, um, odds are a lot of you may already be familiar with the Law School Admission Council. That's where I'm going to start off this webinar, sort of about the nuts and bolts of applying to Georgia Law. The first place you're going to want to go to apply to any law school is the Law School Admissions Council, or LSAC.org. LSAC runs the LSAT, which is the admissions test that you have to take to get into any member of law school, and there's over 150. Um, LSAC hosts forums all around the country and in Canada. Um, Jenna and I went to several of those this year, including one in Atlanta. Uh, Jenna went to Houston, New York, Toronto, LA, San Francisco. Um, I went to, we both went to Miami, um, Boston, and Chicago. So um, if you're in those geographic areas, I strongly encourage you to attend the LSAC forums. It gives you a really good opportunity to meet with representatives like us from um, various other law schools. Um, or if you're still on a university campus and still part of the university community, oftentimes your law school might have a law school fair. Um, and we try to hit up a lot of those too. Um, so it's really great for us to meet people in person, uh, but we also like opportunities like this. So back to LSAC, the Law School Admissions Council puts together the CAS report, or um, which is part of your application. Um, so there's a lot of functions that they have. You're going to want to be familiar with what is available through LSAC. Um, our whole application process is paperless and run through their website. So if you were to email me or Jenna with your resume, um, that's very nice, but that's not how you give us information that becomes a part of your resume, uh, becomes a part of your application. All of that needs to be done through the Law School Admission Council. Now, now onto the big bad issue of um, the LSAT. Um, like I said, that's the exam that you have to take if you want to apply to any law school. Um, when to take the LSAT? There's a bunch of different sort of ways to go about it. Um, for some people, we recommend that you, they take it between their junior and senior year. So, when did you take the LSAT? Um, I took the LSAT June, uh, June before senior year. Um, okay. And um, what about you? I took the October LSAT of my senior year, mm -hmm. and then again in December. Okay. So some people do take it twice. Um, we take the highest score. Um, a lot of people um, feel like maybe the, the first time they took it, it wasn't their best performance. Um, they can do better on a on a later test. Um, if you don't like your score, you can't do anything about it. At that point, you do have to um, deal with the score that you get the first time around, but you can get a, another score and, and try to improve upon it. Um, some people will leave the exam knowing that they did not perform well, and those people cancel their their score. We in the admissions office see all the times that you take 
the LSAT. Um, and we see when you cancel it, we see all the scores that you have, we do accept the highest score, as I previously said. Now, if there's a large disparity between your first score and your second score, sometimes it's beneficial for you to draft an addendum where you explain what you did differently between the first time and the second time. Um, what did you do to prepare for the LSAT, if you remember? Um, I took a power score bar prep course, um, and I you know students who, both that I went to undergrad with and who I'm in school with now, that took various bar prep courses and some that um, prepped independently, and everyone seems to like what they did the best. Um, so it's just kind of to each their own. Right, right. I, I remember way back when I actually showed up to a, a classroom several times over the course of a few weeks, and there was a professor that lectured, and uh, we, or an instructor rather, and then there were practice tests that I could take and practice on some of the, the various aspects of it. Um, as someone who took it two times, did you do something different the first time or the second time? I did. I took a, similarly, I took a course before the October, my first time taking the LSAT, and I wasn't really too happy with my score. So the second time I didn't take a prep course, I just worked on timing. Timing is a big uh, part of the LSAT. You have, I think, a minute and 20 seconds to get through each question. And so all I did was get question after question and do it in a minute and 20 seconds over and over and over again. And I saw a lot of success in my December LSAT score. Okay, great. Um, so that's kind of the LSAT portion of this webinar. Um, some important dates and deadlines that you might want to keep in mind when trying to determine when to take the LSAT are um, when we sort of put our application up for everyone to um, start filling out. Usually that's September 1 of the year prior to the year you wish to matriculate. So for students who want to start law school in fall of 2016, they were able to start viewing our application and working on it in September of 2015. Um, we began to review files and admit people in October because we do rolling admission. Um, November 1st was our binding early decision deadline with files being complete by November 15th. Um, for those of you who might be interested in applying not for 2016 but for 2017, Binding early decision could be a really viable option for some people. Now, I know you took advantage of binding early decision when you applied. Can you share with us why you decided to do that? Well, I, I think my experience is somewhat unique. I, since I went here for undergrad, I was really involved on campus and knew that I definitely wanted to stay in Athens for law school. Um, I have a little brother who is still an undergrad here. My family comes up to visit often. So, um, UGA was the only place that I applied to. It, it, that's where I knew I wanted to go to law school. So I thought, well, I would rather go ahead and submit my application early, um, try to get that out of the way so that I could enjoy the rest of senior year and make sure that I didn't have that weight left on my shoulders. And that's exactly who binding early decision is intended for. People who know that Georgia law is the school that they want to attend. Um, there are some people who take advantage of binding early decision to kind of give themselves a bit of a leg up. Perhaps their scores are just below our median um, and they feel like if they want to show us that if admitted, they definitely will come here. Um, in the admissions office, that certainly is a useful tool for some people to take advantage of. If you have any questions about whether or not binding early decision is right for you, I strongly encourage you to get in touch with an admissions officer like myself, like Jenna, like our um, the other directors in our office, because um, we can help you figure out if it's the right option for you or if it's not. Um, some people do want to apply early, um, not necessarily binding early decision, but they do want to kind of go ahead and get it out of the way so they can enjoy senior year. Um, or if they are working and out of school, so they can go ahead and figure out what they're going to be doing the next year. Um, so if you don't necessarily want to take advantage of binding early decision, it can be useful to simply apply early in the admissions cycle. Um, another deadline you would want to know about, though, is February 1st. February 1st is our deadline for priority merit-based scholarships. So people who take the June, uh, 
October or September, sometimes it falls in September, uh, or December LSATs are certainly in a comfortable position to apply before that February deadline. Um, and, while, and while anyone who applies after that deadline is still eligible for consideration for admission to the law school and still eligible for scholarship dollars, they may not be as much money to go around, frankly, at that point. So if it's really important to you to maximize the potential for scholarship dollars, I encourage you to try to get your application in before that February 1st deadline. Now, June 1st is the deadline for all applications. And we do accept the June LSAT, um, which is very surprising to a lot of people. Now, when you're on the road, Jenna, do you encourage people to wait that long? Well, although we do accept applications up until June 1st, we, I, I if, if it were me, I would not wait until June 1st to submit my application. Yeah, and there's just too many, um, there's too many things outside your control at that point. Um, the class could very well be full if you don't have a, a strong an application. Um, we may not have room for you in the class. So while it is a helpful deadline for some people, um, it is not, you shouldn't rely upon that deadline on its, on its own. Um, so we also admit people off of our wait list over the course of the summer as well. So if you are waiting at that long, you might also be competing with some people who applied earlier and then were put on the wait list. Um, again, if you have specific questions about your own circumstances, I encourage you to reach out to us because we can give you a little bit of guidance um, on that aspect of it. Um, and orientation is in August and classes start in August and um, it's really nice and warm here in Athens in August. Um, um, so we talked about the LSAT. What else do you need for your application now that you know all these deadlines? Um, you need a transcript from your undergraduate institution. Um, even though you went to Georgia, you still had to get Georgia to send that transcript to LSAC where they put it together. It's not like we just walked down the street to the registrar's office. Um, so you do want to make sure that you're giving yourself enough time for your undergraduate institution to get the transcript to LSAC, which then posts it to us. Um, at least two letters of recommendation are required. Um, do you guys remember at all who you got to write your recommendations? I did. I had a professor and um, one of my supervisors at my job to kind of give uh, both sides of my personality and my work ethic. Absolutely. And I had a former uh, professor of mine that I'd taken three courses with him, um, and then also the former dean of the journalism school. Since I was a public relations major, I'd done research for him, and he wrote a letter of recommendation for me. And I think those are some really good examples of great people to get recommendations from, people that you've worked for or people that you've done research for who can speak to the quality of your work, the quality of your character um, that you've worked with on a one-on-one -on -one basis. It might be really cool that you have a family friend who's a U.S. senator, but unless you've actually, you know, worked for that U.S. senator, he or she probably doesn't really know you. But let's say you intern for that senator and work directly for his or her chief of staff. It's probably better to get the chief of staff to write your recommendation. So just keep in mind that we do read these recommendations and um, we can see a cut and paste uh, from a mile away. So it is really beneficial to get someone who you know is going to say really nice things about you because they know that you're a good candidate. Um, and those are also sent through LSAC. Do not send them directly to us. Don't mail them to us. Don't email them to us. Don't walk them over. Send them through LSAC. Um, personal statements. Now that one's really tricky uh, because we have a very open-ended personal statement requirement um, and I think a lot of students get, get sort of torn up about it. Um, I will say brevity is best. Um, a pa uh, like a page and a half, two pages, double spaced, please, because <laughs> it's much easier to read for, for us to read that way. Um, do you remember how many drafts you might have gone through? Or I think I went through three drafts, maybe just going through. And I don't didn't have like three definitive drafts. It was just kind of a, a process. Right. 
right? Did you have someone else look at it? Um, I did. I had um, one of my writing, public relations writing professors take a look at it and help me make sure that it's brief to the point so that it's not dragging on because clarity is something that we strive for in legal writing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, you are allowed to attach additional documents um, such as a resume. So you don't have to regurgitate your resume to us in your personal statement. Your personal statement can be about something a little bit more specific, such as a person who inspires you, um, something that you've overcome, um, why you want to go to law school. I mean, that could be that could be a page and a half right there. Um, we also allow an optional diversity statement, which I think is very helpful for some people who do get bogged down in drafting their personal statement because they want to tell us what's really unique about them, but they feel like it's just getting too mushy. So diversity statement is a good optional page. It could be a page, it could be a paragraph, where you can tell us what makes you a unique addition to our law school. And it's not limited simply to ethnicity. It could be that you are first generation in your family to go to college. You could be polylingual. You could be um, an immigrant. You could just have a really unique experience. Like maybe you were a college athlete. You know, those are things that we definitely want to know about you that may not necessarily be clear from the rest of your application. Um, there's some other optional items that aren't quite as optional, um, depending on what kind of applicant you are. Um, there are some very important parts of the application regarding character and fitness, and I encourage you to read those very carefully. Again, if you have questions, do not hesitate to reach out. We, we want to know a lot about you. It is a protected document. It's not information that we're sharing with everybody. But we need to know if you've had issues with the law, issues with the, um, the board at your school, um, any sort of things like that. And then you must explain to us what has gone on in your past, what has changed, what is still pending. Um, and that's taken into consideration. Um, and yes, that includes traffic tickets. <laughs> Something as silly as a moving violation. Even even warnings as well. So if yeah. you have a lead foot and you get pulled over and then you sweet talk yourself out of it, you still need to disclose that as well. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Just because you're practicing become a lawyer by arguing your way out of things before doesn't mean we don't need to know. And there's a reason behind this. It's not because we need to know all of your business. Um, it's because we want to make sure that we are the gatekeepers to a profession that really doesn't like lawyer jokes anymore. The State Bar of Georgia is, we kind of govern, we, we model our character and fitness questions after what the State Bar of Georgia wants to know. And what they want to know is pretty similar to what any other bar in the U.S. wants to know. And when you get ready to apply to sit for the bar in the state of your choosing, they are going to do a very in-depth evaluation of your past. That will include a review of your file and application to law school. And they want to make sure that you are upfront with us because they don't like it when you aren't. Um, I know in Georgia, you can be prevented from sitting for, for the bar if they find significant character issues. Um, if you have particular questions about that, I encourage you to look at the website of the state bar where you live where you anticipate you might want to practice law someday, and read about their character and fitness requirements. Um, it's a good thing to know on the front end, and I am sure that wherever you end up coming to school, they will work with you a lot on that aspect of the application to become a practicing attorney. So, kind of covered all that meaty, heavy stuff. Um, what are some things that happen once you do apply? Well, we sort of people can sit in committee for a couple of weeks. If you take advantage of binding early decision, we guarantee you a decision by December. Um, so you do know whether or not you've been admitted or moved to the general applicant pool. Um, we do deny people after a few months 
Um, and then there's also a wait list option. Um, if you are either denied or put on the wait list, you are allowed to appeal your decision to the committee. But that must be done with new information that was not available at the time that you applied. A fine example of information that would be helpful for an appeal would be a new LSAT score. Or let's say you finished up college and you really just knocked it out of the park your senior year and your GPA went up. That's definitely something that we would want to know and would be helpful in appealing a waitlist decision or a denial. Um, our waitlist is not ranked. Uh, we do not disclose the size of the waitlist. And we will occasionally ask people over the course of the summer if they're still interested in being on our waitlist. Because some people get tired of waiting, and we totally understand that. And we respect people's decisions to say thank you, but no thank you and make plans to go elsewhere. Um, we have admitted students uh, the day before open house off of the wait list. Um, so if you know that, I mean, sorry, the day before orientation. So if you know that that's something that you could see yourself doing, let us know. You know you're allowed to send us information over the course of the summer saying, I'm still interested. Um, I know I'm on the wait list. Please keep me on the wait list. Um, that kind of leads me to another topic of transfers. Let's say that you decide some point during your first year of law school at another school that you're interested in transferring to Georgia Law. Um, we do accept transfer applications. Um, I would, you can start considering that process in the spring of, um, of your, your first year. Um, we do require you show, you know, that you are in good standing, get a letter of good standing from the, the dean or registrar of your school. Um, I, I would really encourage you, if you have specific questions about transfer, once you've been, you know, once you've kind of gotten into the second semester of your first year, check out our website, circle back with us, and we can talk to you about what's required um, on our end. And whether or not it's a good option for you. For some people, it's not a good option to transfer because they do have a good thing going with their art school and they might be forfeiting some of those opportunities to transfer here. Our transfer students are eligible to write on for journals, um, try out for a new court and mock trial, and participate in on campus interviews. Um, and those are sort of the main questions people ask about transfers. All right, so now that we've kind of gone through the nitty gritty of the application process, um, I definitely encourage people to come and visit us. Uh, you know, visit us here on campus. Uh, you, we have people giving tours every single day that we have class, unless it's the last week of class. So when we're talking here right now, it is November 18th, and class is in next week, so we are not letting people sit in on a class anymore because all the professors are doing is reviewing materials. Um, but any day that we have like a normal class schedule, you can come and sit in on a first year class and you can have students give you a tour of the law school. So you're a dean's ambassador, yes. right? So you give tours and you do things yes. like that. Yes. So you guys could come and visit and hang out with me for an afternoon yeah. or morning <laughs> whenever I'm giving a tour. Yeah. And it's a really good opportunity to, to check out the school. Wherever you end up really seriously considering going to law school, you should definitely take the time to visit the school. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, definitely. Um, when I was choosing a law school back in 2010, the 2010, 2011 cycle, I had top, I had two top two schools. Um, it was Georgia and another. And as soon as I visited the other school, I sat in on a class and I just realized that it wasn't for me. I didn't fit in with the student body. I didn't fit in with the culture of the law school. And every law school has their own culture. And um, here at Georgia, I'm, I might be biased, but I think the best thing about us is our people and, and our culture. And so I fell in love with it right away. And it, it made my decision so much easier just visiting uh, those two schools. All right, great. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about applying to Georgia Law and visiting Georgia Law. Um, I do want to briefly speak about why I think Georgia Law is a really, really great law school and a good option for a lot of people. Um, we have some amazing programming here. Um, we have 15 experiential learning opportunities. Um, and that's expanded from 13 when I started working here a year ago. Um, they range from everything from 
um, you know, civil externships here in the Athens Clark County area to a semester long program in Atlanta, which is beginning next semester to a semester long program in Washington, DC, which has been a very successful program for several years now. Um, there's really a lot here to do. Um, I, when I was in law school here several years ago, I was an intern for Georgia Lawyers for the Arts through the Civil Externship um, Program. I worked 10 hours a week in Atlanta for a nonprofit that provides legal services to artists in the, um, well, really for the entire state of Georgia, but predominantly in the metropolitan Atlanta area. Um, it had nothing to do with what I wanted to do for practice. I just really thought it would be neat to work in Atlanta for a nonprofit and get some experience that I wouldn't have otherwise had. And I know you also had some externship experience in Atlanta. Yes, I, I, they placed me at the CDC, the Centers of Disease Control, and it was awesome. Um, the CDC is a great place to work and a place that I never would have thought I would have enjoyed had it not been for Georgia School of Law. And I also, they, I was also placed at Aspire TV, which is a TV network based in Atlanta, and that was really awesome. My, one of my favorite things I've ever done as an attorney is license the, so, the show Sister Sister. So I got to do that, do that externship, and that was really awesome. It's pretty cool. Do you or your friends have any cool opportunities through experiential learning that they're going to be taking advantage of? So I have friends who are going to be in D.C. next semester. Um, I know one is working for the SEC in D.C. I'm not sure where other, other individuals are going to be, but I do have friends who will be in Atlanta working. Um, as well. So people definitely take advantage of the clinic opportunities. Um, I also have friends who are going to take advantage of the prosecutorial clinic that we offer. So they'll be placed in uh, district attorney like offices across the Northeast Georgia area and we'll get some experience that way. Absolutely. Um, I mean, there are civil opportunities, there's criminal opportunities, there's appellate opportunities. Um, you should definitely take advantage of them when you come to Georgia Law. It'll give you really great experience outside the classroom. It'll pump up your resume. It'll make you very um, appealing to potential employers. Um, so, but that's something that you would take advantage of in your second and third year. Um, your first year is pretty set. You take the same classes as everybody else. Um, you're, we have three sections here, section X, section Y, and section Z. I have the Y. And you know you get pretty devoted to your section and section you should, Z. Section Z. Z. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so you're. It's kind of like homeroom, and you just kind of float around together to all the same classes. Um, but you and you're taking criminal law the first semester, contracts, civil procedure, um, courts, legal research, and writing. And then your second semester of your first year, you no longer take criminal, but you uh, do take um, an elective of your choice, which ranges, I think there's like property, common law one, the criminal procedure. I think there's like a, a litigation, uh, um, sorry, a legislation course. Um, and what did you take as your? I took criminal procedure and thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. I, I, it's a really good course to take. It's on the bar. It's on the bar exam. Yeah. yeah, any course that you can take that's on the bar exam is worth taking. Mm -hmm. um, and so that your first year is pretty set up for you. There are some opportunities to try things outside the classroom, like a closing argument competition and the Russell um, moot court competition. Um, and then there's the write-on at the end of the year where if you want to participate in a journal, um, one of our three journals, you would do that at the end of your first year. So um, we have the Georgia Law Review, the Georgia Journal of Intellectual Property, and the Georgia Journal of International and Comparative Law. Um, so there's three different opportunities for students to participate in um, a really, really good legal writing journal. So they, they review the journals, uh, the journal articles, and they edit them, and they also draft their own note, which counts as their um, we have a writing requirement to graduate, so if you are on a journal, that's taken care of. Um, there's also moot court and mock trial. There's a lot of student organizations. There is a negotiations team, which is a really cool opportunity for people that do want to learn more about advocacy, but in a different way from moot court and mock trial. It's part of sort of the, the business and ethics program here. But there's a lot of really cool stuff. Um, I really encourage you to take a look at our website, including a virtual tour. The virtual tour has 12 videos, all ranging about a minute long, um, that 
are really, really helpful and give you information about the law school itself, what student life is like, experiential learning opportunities and things like that. There's a map so you can kind of poke around and see where things are in the building. Um, but really that's it. Um, do you guys have any sort of final words of advice, things that you wish you had known when you were a prospective student, anything like that? <laughs> I would just say to get excited about the idea of going to law school in general. It's such a, um, a rewarding experience. It's very tough um, and it's always challenging, but you will see yourself grow intellectually in such a short period of time that it's really rewarding to look back after first semester of your first year and think, you know, there are cases that I read at the beginning of the semester that I've highlighted everything except the one rule that I needed to remember. Um, and then at the end of the semester, when you're actually understanding material and seeing how it all fits together, and you think like, wow, I, I, I've come such a, a, so far in such a short period of time. So get excited for it. I would say not to pigeonhole yourself and lock yourself in to say a school that just mainly does criminal law or just all only taking classes that are corporate or, um, that have like a kind of a corporate or transactional field. I, I feel I didn't know what I wanted to do when I came to law school, and I really think I inadvertently helped myself because I took so many different so many different courses. I looked at so many different schools because I just wanted to be really well rounded. And so I would just I would just say to keep an open mind, even though you might be pretty sure you want to be a DA one day. Just keep an open mind because the law is just such a multifaceted realm and um, I think the more that you are open-minded, the more you'll get out of this whole process. Okay, well, I think that wraps it up. Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching. Bye.